Um, we do not have to all be presently in the, you know, in the church. Uh, God has uh, multiple, multiple locations where he dwells. And being that we are to be the temple of God, we can definitely and truly say that it is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord if we are faithful. I'm definitely thankful to be alive today and grateful that God has given me an opportunity to serve on this Sabbath day. Uh, we will have a short word of prayer before we look into our Sabbath school lesson. So if you will, please kneel where you are as we petition the throne of God for his grace and his Holy Spirit. I will give a few short moments for you all to pray um, for yourselves and for me, if you will, and then we will, um, I will uh, close. Father in heaven, we come before you at the foot of your throne and we ask first and foremost for your spirit. We know that it is important for us to seek after righteousness, but we within ourselves are not capable of knowing such a thing unless it were given unto us by your spirit. Unless we are uh, made known to the fact that we need righteousness. We need the righteousness of Christ. Our lives have been in despair. Our lives have been a terrible example of what the condition of the world is in, and we need a better example. And the opportunity that you have given us to be the example is for us to see the example. So we pray that your spirit will make known unto us what this example is, the example of meekness, of being humble, of putting uh, self away in every aspect of life. Give us that character and give us that example at this time, we pray. And we ask that you would please be with the individual requests that were made known we pray that um, you would continue to bless us and give us health and vigor and life that we may be able to continue in the faith. Um, we pray for the individuals who uh, have coworkers that are in need of um, a blessing from you, from heaven. We pray for our family members who are seeking to know what is uh, righteousness and we determine to make them to know what you will have us to know and that is nothing other than christ and him crucified we also pray for the ailments that we all are suffering from may you please uh shed your your blessing abroad and place your hand upon each and every one of us that we may be healed we thank you for hearing our prayer and again, for giving us this opportunity on this Holy Sabbath to come together, even if it be uh, via the internet, that we may draw closer to you and closer together as we uh, build up the body of Christ. We thank you and ask again for your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Happy Sabbath again, brothers and sisters. We are uh in lesson three we actually um were able to finish lesson two last week i'm gonna see if i can share my screen really quickly
So we are in lesson three of our Sabbath school lesson. And lesson three, uh, the title, as you can see, let me see, maybe I can blow this up. There we go. The title, as you can see for lesson three is Overcome with Wine. Overcome with Wine, a very um, important topic, I should say, Overcome with Wine. There are many aspects to this idea of wine and being overcome with it. And we wanna seek to draw um, you know, some points that we can take home so to speak with ourselves or to take with other or to take to others as we learn so the verse that it has given as a uh, i would say a base verse or the start starting verse for this lesson is isaiah 28 so if you will please turn with me to isaiah 28 isaiah 28 what does it mean to be overcome with wine or why would this be in this lesson is this important for us to understand is it important for us to understand what being overcome with wine is or means um i'm definitely sure that god does whatever is in his word he puts it there for our admonition as the bible says and for our understanding for our learning so that we do not lust after evil things. So uh, as we read in Isaiah 1 through 8, I want us, to, um, want us to understand that whatever we read from Isaiah 28, 1 through 8, it is for our admonition, it is for our learning. Though it be the Old Testament, doesn't matter. Even the things in the New Testament, doesn't matter what it is, old or new, all of the things written in the Bible, all of the things that God has said, God has spoken, God has written through his holy prophets are for our learning. It says in Isaiah 28, we will read one through eight. It says, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong and strong one, which as a tempest of hell and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet, and the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way and the, are out of the way the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink they are swallowed up of wine they are out of the way through strong drink they err in vision they stumble in judgment for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean so i wanted to read that uh, just so we can you know have in mind what uh, Isaiah 28, 1 through 8 has said. So a lot of the questions that we read through will be based, uh, we can say will be based on what we just read. So question number one, and there's a memory verse there, but we will read the, the memory verses, I'm sure, um, maybe later in, in this study. If not, <clears throat> we will come back to them at a later time. So it says in question one, what denunciation does the Lord utter against the kingdom of Israel as represented by the tribe of Ephraim in whose midst was the capital city, Samaria? And I'll read Isaiah 28 verse one again. And uh, we do solicit your participation. If you um, are able, please, um, 
you know, share your thoughts, share your comments, your questions as we go through this study. So as I read question one, I would like to have someone answer the question. Isaiah 28, verse one, the Bible says, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, who are, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. So if anyone can answer the first question for me, please do at this time. Well, the Bible says, woe, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So, and that is correct. The Bible says what denunciation. So when we look at, at a woe, or when we look at woes in the Bible, woes are warnings, but woes can also be denunciations, right? God gives you a woe, and, he's, and the warning is because you are in the wrong or because you are in the red, you have a, a warning towards you, meaning that if you do not get out of the red zone or out of the woe warning, then you are uh, presented with this denunciation. This is to you. And the denunciation is not, God is not saying, I'm giving this to you because you're now, you know what I mean? You're now not a part of my, what, whatever it is, you're not a part of my foe. Of course, one who is uh, going against God is a part of the foe, but God doesn't say that is it for you. God is saying, this is a warning so that it won't be it for you in the near future. I'm giving you a woe and I'm warning you of your danger, of your backslidden condition, of your folly, of your rebellion, so that you are not one of the individuals who I turn my back upon. I don't want to turn my back on you, but if you turn your back on me, right? Well, what measure ye meet, it shall be measured back to you again. So God is giving you a denunciation. He's giving you a woe, as we just read. But notice what the woe is towards, or who the woe is towards. Read it again. Isaiah 28, verse 1, it says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. So God is, is even... Uh, uh, diving deeper into the subject or, or making known deeper at, or giving you an understanding of who exactly is this woe pronounced upon, right? Of course, it's towards Ephraim, but it says woe to the crown of pride and to the drunkards of Ephraim. So um, it's very uh, a very serious thing because God now places a crown of pride on Ephraim. God says, you deserve a crown of pride. When in reality, we should deserve or not deserve, but we should be seeking after a, a different type of crown, right? A glorious and beautiful crown. The, as we read through the verses, it, it mentioned the diadem of beauty or glory, if I'm not mistaken. But now, uh, does someone want to make a comment? Because I hear a mic on. Yeah, I wanted to share something really quickly. Also, just in adding to <clears throat> what you were sharing there, because when we look at this, when we look at the story of Ephraim, we also can see um, um, just a little bit more as well as what the scripture is sharing. Because <clears throat> obviously, Ephraim was like to God his firstborn, and they had the truth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they decided to go towards you know false doctrine. They they decided to, you know, as God's people, they decided to um um to basically um you know go after idolatry so there you know it talks about you know you that, that beautiful flower that once beautiful flower you know what i mean but it was pride <clears throat> because they they felt they were god's people they felt they were safe and they they allowed um, um other things to come in basically so um you know again we see here a, a woe upon god's people who are not diligent um in, and, 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 and heeding to the truth and allowing uh, falsehoods to, to come in and, and, and by pride, it's because you say you're a Christian, you, you, 
you, if you don't keep the truth, you don't study the truth, you know, God is pronouncing that woe, you know what I mean? Because you're not, uh, you're not studying, you're not, you know, keeping yourself along that straight path. Yes. Thank you for that. And uh, all, everything you said is definitely, um, you know, can apply and is true. And I, I think about how the crown of pride, um, how it plays a role, a big role in what the, in what God is describing. Uh, when we mention the crown of pride, a crown is given to those who have mastered something or those who are, are um, the, how, uh, what's the word? Those who are the leaders or the, the kings of something, right? So now this crown of pride is symbolizing or signifying that they have mastered or they are the kings of pride, meaning I am the best of this. I own this or I'm in control. I'm, I have conquered pride, not in a good sense, right? I have conquered pride to the, fe- to the point where I know it, uh, you know, from A to Z is the best way I can explain it. So it's very, uh, very sad to see that the crown of pride is now given to Ephraim or Ephraim has the crown of pride. It goes on to say, um, after that, whose glory, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. So there's a lot more in this verse. There's a lot more to break down. Um, I can keep going on and on and on breaking this down, but I do want to go to a verse just to um, kind of back it up. We will go to Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, we will begin reading in Isaiah chapter 40. We will look at verse 6, reading down. So Isaiah chapter 40, and God uses this, this glorious beauty as a flower, right? And in the verse it says, the beauty is a fading flower. So a fading flower is a flower that's eventually going to die right? It's not going to, it's not going to stay uh, beautiful for a long time. It will eventually fade. In the very familiar verse in Isaiah 40, uh, verse 6, reading down, mentions this. It says in verse 6, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof, the beauty of it, right? The goodliness referring to the beauty or the the good works that the thing does or the person does. It says, the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Now, what does the flower of the field do? In the next verse, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. So the, the, what is one of the reasons why the flower will fade? One of the reasons why the flower will fade is because the wind is going to blow upon it, right? Or as the verse says, it says, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. And then it says, surely the people is grass. So when the spirit of the Lord is blowing upon this glorious flower, eventually the flower will fade, right? Uh, I think about the, the, when the wind blows on the flowers in, in, in the earth, uh, a lot of times this will promote germination. You, you get the pollen blowing, you get things moving and going, uh, seeds being scattered around. But at this point, this is not, um, this is not that uh, sim- symbol. When the spirit is blowing upon this flower, this glorious flower that has the crown of pride upon it, it's so that it can be made naked, right? So that everything will be shown about the flower that uh, one would not know. Someone who is glorious in all their own beauty, they need to be exposed, is what God is saying. You're going to be exposed for who you really are. And I think about when, uh, I forget what book this is but the king uh one of the kings thought himself to be so so glorious to the point where people are saying that he is a god and as soon as he 
was exclaimed as a God by others or proclaimed as a God by others, he, and in the spirit of prophecy, it says he didn't give the glory to God at that point. And because he claimed all the glory for himself, he was exposed. How was he exposed? He died. He was killed immediately, instantly for not giving the glory to God. The crown of pride uh, pre prevented him from giving the, the glory to who, who should be receiving it. And because of that, he was exposed. He was made naked or he was shown to be just a mere human. He wasn't a God, right? So it's very uh, interesting to see that God uses this flower to explain to us that um, flowers fade or the beauty of the flower fades. Surely the people are grass and the flowers are clothing the grass. So surely a person who's clothed with many beautiful flowers will eventually fade. So the glory of that person is not what you should think it is, or you should not treat that person as they have their own glory. All men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is what the Bible says. So if there aren't any questions or comments, we will go to the next uh, question. I did have another verse. Actually, let's go to this other verse. I want to make sure I, I do everything on time. Let's go to this next verse, James chapter 1. James chapter one, let's read it very quickly so we can move on. James chapter one, notice what the Bible says in James chapter one. Let me make sure I get there. The Bible says in verse 11, James chapter one, verse 11, dealing with this flower. It says, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade in all his ways. Now the Bible just broke down what it means to have a glorious flower fading. A glorious flower can be tied to a rich person, a person who has a uh, great riches or uh, you know, are increased with goods and have need of nothing. Surely the people are grass and the, the flower covers the grass, but a rich man in his ways will fade eventually. So God is even warning Laodicea at this time or in this verse saying, eventually your condition and you with it will fade. So it, it points us to, uh, it points us to the judgment hour. If you, uh, if you want to use that. I mean, we can use it. It points us to a time where God will judge the flower for not giving glory to the one who created it. And then the flower will fade permanently, right? And then new flowers will be made in the earth made new. We will be going to the second question. Question number two says, what power would he bring against them? And what will be the result? And then it, it says verse two of Isaiah 28. Um, and then it has something else at the end, but we will go to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. What power will he bring against them? Speaking of Ephraim. And it says, what power will he bring against them? Um, and what will be the result? Verse two of Isaiah 28. Verse two says, behold, the Lord hath a mighty one a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hell and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with hand. So who is it that God will bring against them? Can someone please answer the question? Um. Uh, verse two just gives a description of what the destruction will be like, mm -hmm. but um, I said verse two gives just a description of what the destruction will be like. But question two, if you continue, it gives uh, what I believe many of us are kind of familiar with. It says evidently fulfilled three or four years after by the king of Assyria, which is the king of the north. Uh, I'll go ahead and read Second Kings seventeen. Okay. Um, 
And the beauty of this is that it brings to view that preparation for us as a people is a necessity. Um, because what the Bible shows consistently is that God's people or those who profess to be God's people will not avoid the judgment as it were, or will not avoid destruction if they disobey. So it's like, we've already uh, chosen God. We've already made a profession of God, which means our day is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord willing, we choose him. Lord willing, we're faithful, but we will not get away from the King of the North or any disobedience that has uh, dishonored his name. Uh, so I'm reading Second Kings. Uh, 17 and I think I'm reading verse 6 here sorry about that my phone just closed 17 verse 6 it says in the ninth year of Hosea the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel into Assyria and placed them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Uh, for so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. So on and so forth. So um, God would bring a, against them a, tor a storm, a tempest, but that was a symbol of the king of the north. And it's important to identify that the Syria, Syrian king was the king of the north and why he would punish. And what you'll find is uh, as a result of the disobedience of God's people or whenever there's a people that are to stand for God and they disobey God, God often brings the king of the north. And the king of the north is, in many ways, a. Uh, it, in many ways, the king of the north represents them. So it's like they may look at themselves as godly people, and God says, "No, uh, the king of the north is going to come because you're not godly." And what you'll often find is, uh, before the king of the north comes, God's people themselves were as destructive as the power that's destroying them. So. We may think we're religious, but we're doing the same thing that the king of the north does, and that is disobey and destroy people, the people of God. So I can't overemphasize that point, and I hope I'm not mixing it up, but it's, it's important to note that if we disobey God, if we go against God, we will meet the same fate of those who have come across our path. If we're not faithful, then we are a destroying power. We are a storm. We are a tempest. We're just like the king of the north, and we will be destroyed by another power that's just like we are, uh, even though we may not see it. So it's a uh, it's important to the study is important to bring that point out. Um, more could be said on that, but nevertheless, uh, it's the story of the king of the north. Thank you for that. Um, it reminds me of. Um, when Saul was to be made king and Samuel broke down what would happen um, because they wanted Samuel or they wanted Saul to be the king. And he was like, he's going to take your, your sons and your daughters. He's going to take half of this, half of that, because you did not want the Lord, your God, to be your king. And it, it, as you were saying, um, the king of the north is... Um, in representation of the individuals who uh, did the same things as he did or as he would do, which is disobey and rebel. Uh, we will go to our next question. Next question, number three. It says, what will typify Samaria and her soon coming destruction? And the answer is verse four. It also gives the answer um, in short right after um, the verse. So we'll go and read it. It says in verse four of Isaiah 28, and the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which men or which when he that looketh upon it, seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. And the short answer it gives was the last part. 
a fading flower, the first fruit greedily plucked and hastily devoured. Now, what does this um, bring to mind? When I looked at this, I, I laughed because it, it shows how the Bible is uh, very much inspired. Uh, I'm thinking about times where we go to the market and, or not even the market, maybe we got some fruit in our backyard or something. And, you know, the fruits uh, are beginning to look ripe and there are some that, that may look riper than other, others. And you go to, go to pick one to taste it to see if it's ready, right? You taste it and see if it's ready and it's bitter. Uh, it, it reminds me of the parable of the uh, fig tree or when Jesus came to the fig tree, it had leaves only and no figs. There's a lot of beautiful lessons in that um, parable or that example that Christ was teaching before the fig tree. But nonetheless, you eat this fruit that looks ready and sometimes we test it to see if the other ones might be ready. So you grab one, you taste it, and it's bitter. It looked like it might have been ready. You know, you grab it and you say, maybe this one is ready, and it'll, it'll um, prep me for the other ones to let me know maybe I should try some more or maybe they're ready to pick. And because it's bitter, you say, all right, I got to leave it alone. You hastily eat it with the hopes of eating some more, but it's the bitterness of it uh, causes you to... Um, you know, kind of devour it and then just leave everything else alone because they're not ready yet or they're still prepping. They're still going through their development process. But the one that you picked that looked like it was ready, you say, mm, oh, it's bitter. It's not ready. Right. So I thought about that when I read the answer for this. And it, it made me think about how um, the individuals who are not ready but proclaim themselves to be or seem as though they're they're ready they're picked and they're devoured or judgment is executed on them speedily right they are already ripe for destruction is what jesus says or mentions in a certain chapter uh, i forget what chapter it is um we will go to our next question question number four question if there aren't any questions or comments i don't want to skip over anyone's questions or comments Okay, question four, it says, what was the direct cause of Israel's destruction? If someone can please read 2 Kings 17, 14 through 18. No reader? I can read it then. 2 Kings 17, 14 through 18. And again, the question, what was the direct cause of Israel's destruction? It says, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. We can stop right there. If, if, if we're looking at this from the point of what the questions are saying, right? Um, question four, what was the direct cause of Israel's destruction? We can already stop at what we just read, but notice how it goes on. It said they would not hear and they hardened their necks just like their fathers did, but it goes on. We could have stopped, but it goes on. It says in verse 15 and right. And means they added something else to whatever was already read and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them and they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the lord had charged them that they should not do like them we could stop there too it's very funny to see how many things that they added on to what they already had in the first verse, right? Stiffening their necks and being just like their fathers. So everything that is being mentioned at this point is what the fathers did in the past. So when it goes on to say, and they didn't keep his statutes, and they wanted to be like everybody else that God charged them not to be like, it's, it's, degrading the individual or degrading the nation showing that 
uh, the example that they had, even though the example was righteous, even though the example was uh, glorious and holy, I'm speaking of the examples of Jesus Christ and his merits, even though they had all of those things, it wasn't enough for them. Is that what we are saying in our daily experience? We have so many examples of how Christ is, is wonderful and, and beautiful and glorious and holy, undefiled, all of these things. And yet the Bible says, and they did this and they did that. It goes on to say in verse 16, and they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worship all the hosts of heaven and serve Baal. Now, why did it say they worship all the hosts of heaven? Right? All the hosts of heaven, when there should only be one that should be worshiped, there's one God, right? Of course, we're speaking of the three individuals that God had, but there is one God that should be worshiped and served, God the Father himself, right? We should worship Jesus Christ himself through the spirit of God or by the spirit's leading. But it said they rather worship all the rest of the hosts of heaven instead of God himself. Instead of the one true host of heaven that should be worshiped, they rather worship everything else and then make uh, uh, graven images and, and worship calves and all of these things. It says, uh, verse 17, and they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to the evil or to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. When somebody is provoking someone to anger, they're trying to start a fight, right? I want to start a fight with you. I'm going to provoke you to do something to me, which is why a lot of times we see uh, some of our fathers, right? We can't get away from the fact that they, a lot of those individuals in the past were our fathers. They were the ones who passed down um, the oracles unto us, even though they didn't follow in the footsteps, they were before us, our forefathers, right? These individuals provoke God to anger provoked him to anger by everything we just read. And when you provoke someone, it's intentional. We may say, no, they didn't know. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know they was uh, making God angry. They didn't. Are you sure about that? They provoked God to anger by all the things he told them they should do, which they then in turn did the opposite. Let's fight, is what they were saying. What are you going to do? Do something to me. That's what we. That's how individuals get in in our world at the moment, right? They, you walk close to a person, even now with this with this COVID, you get too close. Stand. Can you get back, please? Why are you so close to me? You know what? You get close to me again. Provoke, provoke you to anger, which is you know it. it it shows that this is a method used by Satan or one of, the method, one of the methods Satan is using to get us to come out of our Christian characters that we should have at this time. Provoking you to anger, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna get angry? Are you gonna swing? God will have us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Remember what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did all throughout Jesus's experience or all throughout Jesus's ministry, what did they do? They provoked him to anger. They want him to get angry. The only anger he showed was the zeal he had for God's house. That's the only anger he showed. God or Jesus was angry because we didn't do everything that we're reading right now, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't do anything that we're reading at the moment. They rejected his commandments. Are you sure, brother? They were keeping the commandments. They were the keepers of the law. No, they were not. They were supposed to be. I wanted to mention also um, that uh, an easy way to understand provoking in the Bible is whenever God says, if you don't do this, or if you do this, then I'm going to do this. So it's 
whenever you have God identifying what he's going to do if you do something uh, and you do that, then that is like considered at its that that's like considered the epitome of provoking God. So when you look at Israel in these cases, uh, these are things that God directly told them not to do. Or these are things that God directly told them not to do. And he says, if you do this, this will be the result. Mm -hmm. So we can almost always guarantee that if God says, you know, don't do this. And if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And the people actually do that. You could almost guarantee 100 percent of the time that you're going to also see somewhere in the Bible where what God said he was going to do also will take place. So we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to see if we bring it down to our time with like, for instance, the Mark of the Beast. Uh, the Mark of the Beast is really, in a sense, a response to uh, people not following the true God, you know, the, the creator God. God's like, you don't follow the true God, then this is the route you're going to take. You are going to make a false God. And if you do that, you're going to catch my wrath. Uh, what will happen in the end of time is what has been happening consistently throughout history. The mark of the beast for us is just our final point of, it is our calf moment. Just like in these cases, God is saying, you worship the calf. You didn't follow my ordinances. So we're seeing it's, this story is important for us to understand because it's being played out in our present time. And uh, the unfortunate thing is what's going to be brought out is the reason why it's going to happen <clears throat> is because we will be drunk or because men will be drunk or religious people will be drunk. That's what's going to lead them to make these terrible decisions to ultimately end up being destroyed. So we want to make sure we learn from that, not to be drunk, if that makes sense. Amen. Um, and um, what I just read, I, I forgot. I didn't want to skip over verse 17, dealing with how um, they cause, and we can read verse 17, it says, and they cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Uh, from what we just read, and we got another verse to read, but from what we just read, all of the verses, um, you can see the individuals, the nation going deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Not only that, but deeper and deeper and deeper into false doctrine. They're going in the direction of one who is deceived by wine or false doctrine. Now they're divining. Now they're using divination. Now they're using enchantments, right? The what God had proclaimed in the past about these individuals, uh, sorcerers, witches, and what have you, those individuals were to be killed immediately, stoned. That was not to, to be around the, the grounds, so to speak, of the Lord. So anyone or any person who practiced these things, they were led astray by false doctrine. They were informed beforehand that this is not right. This is something that God says is evil. But now they are practicing it. What happened? How did they get so confused? They decided to partake of the wine or false doctrine. They were overcome with wine as the lesson is entitled. Verse 18 says in Isaiah uh, 28, or is this Isaiah 28? Yes. Verse 18 says, uh, therefore the Lord was angry with Israel. Oh, I'm sorry. This is second Kings, second Kings 17 verse 18. Sorry about that. It says, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left, but the tribe of Judah only. So you have the provoking going on by everything we just read them provoking the lord to anger and as the lord was provoked to anger and was very angry with israel then you have the result of his anger being brought out right you provoke me long enough then you will receive what you was trying to provoke me for which is removal the bible says the lord removed him or removed them out of his 
sight. Now, being removed out of the Lord's sight is a very uh, dangerous thing to uh, <laughs> to receive. You being removed out of the sight of an individual who sees everything. I don't know. That's that's terrible. There's no other explanation for it. If God sees everything in existence and can see from the ends of the earth and the ends of the universe, then if he can't see you, I have nothing else, else to say. God removing them out of his sight is him removing uh, what he detests, what he doesn't like to see, right? We go through the abominations a lot. We go through the detestable things. We go through the things that are evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, notice, Satan himself is not removed yet. So if God removes you from his sight before Satan, what does that say about you? It is written in, um, it is written in, in the word of God that ye are gods, right? And we're not to be gods as, you know, like Satan wanted to be. I'm going to be higher than God, but we will be like God. Ye are gods. Or God wants you to be just like him. Now, if you then are overcome with wine to the point where you have provoked God to anger, to so much anger that even his enemy is, is uh, you know, his enemy is using you to the point where he can get you to provoke him to anger, right? To curse God and die, as the book of Job says. And then you are removed. But God's worst enemy, which is the inventor, the creator of sin itself, is still alive. That doesn't say too much or anything good about the individual that was removed, right? The individual that was removed took it a step further than Satan is trying to do it. We, Of course, Satan is provoking everyone to go against God and get everyone to die on uh, their own behalf, right? He provoke you, you make your own decision. But you yourself are created in the image of God, in the image of God. And now you provoke your own uh, savior, your own God to anger to the point where he removes you is very bad. Very, very bad. We have 10 more minutes. If there aren't any questions or comments, we will go to our uh, maybe our last question, which is question five, and we will try to close out. Question five says, what prohibition did the Lord lay upon those who ministered in sacred things and taught the people? The verse it gives is Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. Very, um, very interesting to say the least that one who was created in the image of God will seek to provoke their own maker or their own father, their own creator. The, the spirit of God itself provoked them to anger to the point where they say, I don't even want to see this person no more. They need to be removed out of my sight. That's very crazy to think about. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 10, again, the question is, what prohibition did the Lord lay upon those who ministered in sacred things and taught the people? The verse in Leviticus says, uh, verse 10 or chapter 10, verse eight and nine, it says, and the Lord spake unto Aaron saying, do not drink wine nor strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations lest ye die. Now, God wasn't just talking about the natural uh, realm of this uh, saying. Don't drink wine naturally. Don't go in there and drink wine uh, or don't drink strong drink when you go into the tabernacle naturally. And that's it, right? There's both natural and spiritual. God always ties together the two, always. There are some cases where, you know, uh, when we deal with prophecy and we speak about a lion with wings and uh, bare feet and so on and so forth, those types of things, of course, it's not natural. But when we deal with the uh, what can be applied, which is strong drink, 
or wine, which will degrade the internal system of the body, right? Wine can damage your stomach. Wine can damage your liver. So if it is applied to that, or if it can apply to that, as my, my brother always says, or the pastor always says, if it applies, then it applies. If it is damaging naturally to your liver, but it also is uh, likened unto a false doctrine, meaning there's a symbolic form to it in the spirit, spiritual realm as well, then God is talking about both, right? He told Aaron, you or your sons don't drink strong wine, don't take strong drink when you go and minister inside the tabernacle of the Lord, lest ye die. Now, people drink wine naturally in our day and age, wake up, have a drink of wine with breakfast. We have studies from scientists that say these things are good to do. They're good for your health. They're good for the skin. Wake up, pour a glass of Chardonnay or pour some wine, drink it, eat some eggs and bacon, you'll be fine. It will decrease the lifespan or it will, it will increase your lifespan. You will look younger. Studies that scientists uh, are, are coming out and claiming wine helps on an in the, or in the individual. But here God says, you drink strong drink, you drink wine, you will die. Some may say, well, I, I had some wine yesterday. I'm still alive, as you can see. Okay. But what is being done inside your body? You know, uh, when your liver is damaged to the point where it cannot function anymore, or when your stomach is uh, scraped from all of the, the liquor and, you know, so on and so forth, that shortens the lifespan of the individual, right? You don't have the healthy liver that you had prior to you drinking that wine. And you know what that does? That destroying your liver or your stomach or the internals, your kidneys or whatever is destroying is killing you. When God says you will die, God is saying you will die, right? May not drop dead at the moment, but you are being killed. You are dying. And then look at the spiritual realm. God is using both realms to uh, put fear in our hearts to refrain from these things, to stay away from these poisons, these toxins. God says in the spiritual realm that false, false doctrine is something that will lead you to your demise, to your destruction, to him removing you out of his sight. Let's go to Hosea. Turn to Hosea chapter four. Let's confirm that. Hosea chapter four. God is not gonna tell you don't do that because it is pleasing, right? Or yes, because it is pleasing. God wants everything uh, that is beneficial to us to be to our benefit. But if wine is not beneficial, then he's saying, uh, don't do it because it's not beneficial. Don't do it because it is uh, destructive to your health. I didn't say, or God is not saying that you won't be pleased by it because we have our own, uh, you know, our own decisions, our own feelings, our own motives. We can drink wine and say, this is good. To you, it is good, right? To us, something may be good, but to God, that very good thing is the worst thing for you. So God is not saying it so you won't be happy. He's saying it because you will be happy in a bad sense. You will be so happy to the point that you won't give it up. You will destroy yourself because your happiness has deceived you in drinking this wine. You were overcome. The Bible says in Hosea chapter four, this will be our last verse and we will close. Hosea chapter four, verse 10, it says, reading down, for they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine, what does it do? It take away the heart. What does it do? It takes away the heart. Whoredom and wine and new wine takes away the heart, right? And we're not talking about the new wine that God is seeking to give unto us. The, 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 as, as Jesus says, 
new wine must be put into new bottles. If we are still an old bottle, then the new wine doesn't matter. The old bottle will burst. Jesus says this, but it says that the whoredom and wine, now is bringing whoredom into it. Whoredom and wine and new wine takes away the heart. How will it take away the heart? The heart will be overcome, right? When someone is overcome or when something is overcome, they are taken away. We think about when the captives were carried to Babylon. What happened to them? They were overcome by the king of Babylon. And Babylon, in many senses, is a... Uh, uh, one of the greatest powers that is overcome with wine itself. So I thank you, brothers and sisters, for your, your listening, for the participation of everyone um, who participated. And those who are reading along with us, your participation is, is uh, greatly uh, admired as well. But we will close there. We will close at question five of lesson three. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you at the foot of your throne. And what was mentioned during this study is a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in, but it is for our benefit that we should take it in, that we should uh, assimilate it in our daily, daily lives, that we should allow it to simmer within our minds. Uh, we do not want to be overcome with wine. We do not want to be overcome with strong drink. But we do not also want to be those who draw nigh with our lips and our hearts are far from you. So we pray that you will allow your spirit to convict our hearts, even throughout the remainder of this day, so that we may be partakers of the divine nature, that we would walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, and that we would notice the things that are keeping us from uh, remaining in your sight the things that may be strong drink, the things that may be wine unto us, and the doctrines that we may have learned from uh, past uh, individuals in our daily lives or may be something that we have taught ourselves. We pray that you will help us to put away those things so that we may be able to be filled with the new wine and that we may be made into new bottles to receive the new wine. And that new wine we know is the life of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. We thank you for hearing our prayer and giving us an opportunity to study today and for uh, allowing your spirit to be amongst us. And we pray that you will remain with us throughout the, this Sabbath and these holy hours. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 I, I think this study here is a wonderful example of the Laodicean condition. And, and making sure that we don't, that we recognize our condition.